second. Okay, we are live. All righty. What's happening there? There we are. Okay, welcome and Hare Krishna. So first we're going to chant Jai Radha Madhava as we normally do. Jai Radha Madhava Kunya Vihadhuvi Jai Radha Madhava Kunya Vihadhuvi Gopi Janab Balagupa Giri Badadhadi Gopi Janab Balaba Giri Badadhadi Yashoda Nanda Navraja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nanda Navraja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Banachadi Yamuna Tira Banachadi Jaya Randha Madhuva Kunja Vihadhuti Jaya Randha Madhuva Kunja Vihadhuti Gopi Janamalaba Giri Bharadhagudi Gopi Janamalaba Giri Bharadhagudi Yashoda Nanda Navraja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nanda Navraja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Ranhumad Uva Kunya Vihadhuti Jaya Ranhumad Uva Kunya Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Paravidakacharya Also Teta Siddhi Shimad His Divine Grace Avaya Chalanan Avakipadanda Gosami Shila Prabhupada Kijai Iskan Founder Acharya Shila Prabhupada Kijai Anandagoti Vaishna Vrindi Kijai Namacharya Shila Prabhupada Stakur Kijai Prem Se Goho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Vaidya Gadadha Shri Vasudhi Gaur Vakta Vrinda Kijai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Govind Gopinath Shayam Kund Radha Kunda Giri Govardhan Kijai Vrindavanam Kijai Vitvaradam Kijai Navadiptam Kijai Jagadatha Sami Kijai Yamunamai Kijai Shimati Gulasi Devi Kijai Samaveda Pakta Vrindi Gijai, Gaur Primananda Hari Hari Bo. All glorious the assembled devotees, all glorious the assembled devotees, all glorious the assembled devotees, all glorious to Shri Guru and Gauranga Shila Prabhupad Gijai, Gaur Primananda Hari Hari Bo. Nava Om Vishnu Pataya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Shivani Bhakti Vedanta Swami Namani. Namaste, Saraswati Devi, Gauravani, Pacharani, Nivashesha, Shinyavati, Paschacha, Dejatarani. So, Omagana, Timananda, Shagananjana, Shmakaya, Chakshun, Unmilitam, Yena, Tasmai, Shigarave, Maha, 
I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So now we're going to continue with our uh, with our Bhagavad Gita discussion. So, hold on a second. We're going to share our screen. We're on the 14th chapter, and we're going to begin with text 7 today. Here we go. So, remember, uh, this chapter is about the three modes of material nature. And as we mentioned many times before, that more verses... Uh, are dedicated to the three modes of material nature and the different aspects of the three modes of material nature in the Bhagavad Gita than any other topic. And why is that important? Because we are under the three modes of material nature and we should be able to identify the three modes of material nature. We should be able to understand who and what to associate with and who and what to not associate with. Because these three modes of nature affect every aspect of our lives. That means, every aspect of our lives means what we eat, uh, who we associate with, what type of music we listen to, etc. That's why Krishna spends so much time on the three modes of nature, because that's where we're at right now. We are, of course, if you're a devotee, we mentioned this yesterday, if you're actually following the practices and principles of Krishna consciousness, you're not controlled by the three modes. That is true. But you may be influenced by the three modes until you come to the point of pure devotional service. So be able to identify. Like if you find yourself getting really out of control and angry, instead of just thinking, I'm out of control and angry, or not even being aware of it, just thinking. One should think, ooh, the mode of ignorance is becoming prominent. And then when you really want something, you look uh, on the internet and you think, I must have it, I must have it, I must have it. Then you're thinking, that is the mode of passion. And when you're looking out at the beautiful sky, as we mentioned yesterday, that occurs usually outside of my house, then you're thinking, this is goodness. And when you're in love with Krishna, ready to do whatever he wants, and only taking pleasure from his pleasure, then you're in transcendental goodness. So it's really easy to understand what mode you're in at a particular time. And interesting, we are influenced by different modes uh, throughout the day. That's a fact. Let's say if you're sleeping in the morning, and you don't want to get up, uh, that means mode of ignorance. So even if you get up and you're thinking, I want to give class, Bhagavatam class, so everyone will appreciate how wonderful I am, or leave Kirtan so everyone will appreciate how wonderful I am, then that's the mode of passion where you want profit, address, and distinction. Or if you're thinking, oh, let me just go for a walk in the forest. I will also chant Hare Krishna. But walk in the forest, on the trails, through the woods, then you're influenced partially by the mode of goodness. So really, you should be able to analyze your day like that, the different times of the day. Now, of course, you can use those modes in Krishna's service. Like if you're very enthusiastic, I want to build a temple for Krishna, I want to build a temple for Krishna, then you're being passionate for Krishna, so that mode of passion becomes transcendentalized. Like that. Or the mode of goodness. You want to have everything nice and clean in the temple. So then it becomes transcendental. Okay, let's continue reading about the modes of nature. To me, it's a very interesting, fascinating subject matter in the Bhagavad Gita. Vajo ragatma kam piti trishna sanga samud bhavan pani bhat nati kontiya kama sange na dehi nam Raja, the mode of passion, ragatma kam, born of desire and lust, vidi no, trishna with a hankering, sanga association, samud bhavan, produce of, tat that, 
Vibhadnati binds Kunti, O son of Kunti, Karma Sangena, by association with fruit of activity day and on the body. I thought we read this one. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I think we read this. I mean, I read Bhagavad Gita continually. Yep, we read this one. Uh, ignorance is delusion of all body. We read that one. We read that one. Uh, my notes. All right. Let's go ahead. We read that one. Uh, yeah, we read that one. That one. It's interesting. I guess my notes were up, but it's increasingly. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, my notes were off on that one. Yeah, 12. You're right. All right. I remember reading all of these. Yeah. Then we read up to 12. Let's read 13. Prakasha uh, Pravitisha Ramodo. Wait a second. Pramada moha heva cha tamas shetani jayante vipade kuru nandana avrakasha darkness of pravritihi inactivity cha and pramadaha madness moha illusion eva certainly cha also tamasi the mode of ignorance etani these jayante are manifested vipade when developed kuru nandana son of kuru. When there is an increase in the mode of ignorance of son of kuru, darkness, inertia, Madness and illusion are manifested. When there is no illumination, knowledge is absent. One in the mode of ignorance does not work by a regulated principle. He wants to act whimsically for no purpose. Even though he has the capacity to work, he makes no endeavor. This is called illusion. Although consciousness is going on, life is inactive. These are the symptoms of one in the mode of ignorance. And text 14... Yada satve pravrite tu pralayam yati deha brit adotama vidham lokan amalan pratipadyate Yada when satve the mode of goodness pravrite developed to but pralayam dissolution yati goes deha brit the embodied tada at that time utama vidham of the great sages lokan the planets amalan pure uh, pratipadyate attains. When one dies in the mode of goodness, he attains to the pure, higher planets of the great sages. So Prabhupada explains, one in goodness attains higher planetary systems like Brahmaloka or Janaloka, and there enjoys godly happiness. The word Amalan is significant. It means free from the modes of passion and ignorance. There are impurities in the material world, but the mode of goodness is the purest form of existence in the material world. There are different kinds of planets for different kinds of living entities. Those who die in the mode of goodness are elevated to the planets where great sages and great devotees live. Okay, text 15. This is just the destination of those in the different modes. Rajasi pralayam gatva karma sangi shujayate Tata pralina tamasi murayoni shujayate rajasi uh, rajasi impassion pralayam dissolution gatva attaining karma sangishu in the association of those engaged in fruit of activities jayate takes birth tata similarly pralina ha din dissolve tamasi in ignorance. Muda Yonishu, in animal species, Jayate takes birth. 
When one dies in the mode of passion, he takes birth among those engaged in fruitive activities. And when one dies in the mode of ignorance, he takes birth in the animal kingdom. And Prabhupada comments that some people have the impression that when the soul reaches the platform of human life, it never goes down again. This is incorrect. According to this verse, if one develops the mode of ignorance after his death, he is degraded to an animal form of life. From there, one has to again elevate himself by an evolutionary process to come again to the human form of life. Therefore, those who are actually serious about human life should take to the mode of goodness and in good association transcend the modes and become situated in Krishna consciousness. This is the aim of human life. Otherwise, there's no guarantee that the human being will again attain to the human status. So, of course, this is a big impetus for us to preach Krishna consciousness. Understanding that practically everybody out there is destined to become an animal or less in their next lives. Next verse. Karmana sukritasya hu satvikam nimalam palam Rajasastu palam dukam, ajnanam tamasa palam, karmanaha of work, sukratasya payas, ahu is said, satvikam, in the mode of goodness, nirmalam, purified, palam the result, rajasaha on the mode of passion too, but palam the result, dukam misery, ajnanam, nonsense, tamasa the mode of ignorance, palam the result. Translation, the result of pious action is pure and is said to be in the mode of goodness, but action done in the mode of passion results in misery and action performed in the mode of ignorance results in foolishness. So, of course, the action done in the mode of passion appears to be pleasurable in the beginning. But here Krishna is not talking about the beginning. He's talking about the result. And elsewhere, Krishna mentions that happiness in the mode of passion is like nectar in the beginning, or appears to be like nectar in the beginning. But the end is like poison. So anything you're just like really passionate about, you want to possess someone or enjoy in a gross physical way, it actually causes so much stress later on. And the other two, action performed in the mode of ignorance, results in foolishness, we know about that, and goodness uh, is the result of pious activities and makes one peaceful. The result of pious activities in the mode of goodness is pure. Mm. Therefore, the great sages who are free from all illusion are situated in happiness, but activities in the mode of passion are simply miserable. Any activity for material happiness is bound to be defeated. If, for example, one wants to have a skyscraper, so much human misery has to be undergone before a big skyscraper scraper can be built. The financier has to take much trouble to earn a mass of wealth, and those who are slaving to construct the building have to render physical toil. The miseries are there. What to speak of those who die in the construction of a skyscraper? I remember there was some story about the Empire State Building in New York, which was the original skyscraper in New York. So many people died uh, while they were constructing it. Thus, Bhagavad Gita says that in any activity performed under the spell of mode of passion, there is definitely great misery. They may be little so-called mental happiness. I have this house or this money, but this is not actual happiness. Because you have to maintain the house, you have to maintain the money, you have to maintain your family. I mean, the more you have in this world, the more struggle there is just to maintain it or to protect it. For example, you have the story of Sanatan Goswami. Okay, let's take this story as a good illustration of this point. Sanatan Goswami. Uh, he was put in jail. Why was he put in jail? Because he wanted to leave government service and the government happened to be run by the Nawab Hussein Shah. And 
And the Nawab Hussein Shah wanted him to do his government service, and he refused to do his government service, and he was put into prison. So he had some money that was kept aside by his brother, Rupa Goswami, and he used that money to bribe the jailer. And the jailer had a good excuse, so Sanatan jumped in the river with his chains on, he drowned, you know, who knows what happened with Sanatan. So, anyway, so he escaped from prison. And he thought, now I'm free and I don't have anything to worry about. But what he didn't understand at that particular point is that his servant who was accompanying him had eight gold coins with him. So you were thinking, you know, eight gold coins, you know, and they're not going to broadcast it to the whole world. <clears throat> that he has eight gold coins. Okay. So what happens is that they come to a mountain pass, a mountain that they wanted to go over, and there was a hotel and a hotel keeper, and the hotel keeper had an astrologer or uh, some guy who could figure out how much money people had. I guess astrologer, you can tell by certain signs or whatever, look at the sky or whatever. So uh, this astrologer said to the hotel keeper uh, that these guys, they have eight gold coins with them. And the hotel keeper said, all right, we're going to kill them and take the old eight gold coins from them. So Sanatan Goswami was very expert. He saw that the hotel keeper was acting really nice to him and saying to him, you know, whatever you want, sir, we'll give you. We're your humble servants. And Chanaka Pandit, who presents to us this uh, Nittai Shastra, that means understanding and ordinary dealings, how to interact with people. It's not exactly a devotional service, but understanding ordinary dealings, which Srila Prabhupada uh, gave us too. Uh, Sanatana Goswami was thinking, too much devotion is a sign of a thief. So he was thinking, what am I going to do? I must have something that this guy wants. We must be in a precarious situation. So he turns to his servant, his servant's name was Ishan, and he says to Ishan, uh, how much money do you have with you? Do you have anything of value? And Ishan says, I have seven gold coins. Now he lied to Sanatana Goswami. And Sanatana Goswami said, you know, come on, give them to me. Not because Sanatana Goswami wanted them. So Sanatana Goswami went to the hotel keeper and said, here are these gold coins. I have no use for them. I'm a sannyasi. I'm renounced. Please help us cross the ocean. And the hotel keeper said to him that I knew you had eight gold coins by uh, the words of my astrologer. And so this night I was getting ready to kill you, to take those gold coins. But thank God you're giving me these gold coins so I'm not implicated in the sinful reactions of killing you first. And I will help you over the mountains, don't worry. So the moral of the story is that when you have something, of course, most people don't have expert astrologers, but when you have something like that or you have a lot of possessions, it might be, well, at least, excuse me, and this allergy, cause people at least to be envious or at least want to attack you and take what you have. So you have to be very, very careful. And if you have nothing, then, excuse me, if you have nothing, then you have nothing to worry about. So, <laughs> so I'm not advocating that. <coughs> excuse me. It's allergy season here. I'm not advocating that we just give up everything. But <coughs> understand that when we do acquire more things in this world, it does cause some anxiety. Of course, one should be ready to take anxiety for Krishna. Just like, excuse me, just like we have the temple here, and we're doing some building and doing so many things here for the deities. And, but the more 
temple facility it is that we have, the more anxiety is there just to take care of it, when things break down, and the more devotees that come, the more counseling they require, <laughs> the more encouragement, the more prasadam they require. And so, it's actually more stress. And we see that Srila Prabhupada voluntarily put himself into anxiety in order to serve Krishna. I mean, there's that typical example, a famous example. When Prabhupada sent Tamal Krishna Maharaj to purchase the land in Mayapur, and there were so many dacoids around and everything like that, Prabhupada was in complete anxiety about, uh, about Tamal Krishna Maharaj's safety. And he was relieved. He was up all night. Prabhupada couldn't take rest because he was in anxiety about that. Prabhupada also stated that he was in anxiety when he's not present, that the devotees would not take care of the deities properly. So you see that more possessions in this world create anxiety. However, the perfection of life... Let me turn off my phone. The perfection of life is to take anxiety from Krishna. <laughs> because that anxiety, as long as it doesn't interfere with one's performance of sadhana and one's which means one's hearing and chanting and dedication to the spiritual life as long as it doesn't take away from that that anxiety is purifying like if you're a businessman and you're making a lot of money and you're giving it to Krishna and you're an anxiety that anxiety is purifying because without anxiety then you don't do anything in this world so Prabhupada, he was very happy in Vrindavan before he left to go to America. In fact, you know, he's in Krishna's land, he was in touch with Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, all the Goswamis, living in the Radha Damanara temple. And so, even some people criticized Prabhupada for leaving Vrindavan at such an old age. But Prabhupada took the anxiety of managing or starting the Krishna consciousness movement and the stress of going into a strange country with practically no material resources to please Krishna. Now that's love. Now that anxiety, that distress is actually a very high stage of devotional service. Prabhupada actually said one time, an easy life and Krishna consciousness don't go well together. That's a very interesting quote. That means, you know, people want, sometimes people want to retire at the ripe old age of 30. It's a joke. Or 40. But Prabhupada said an easy life in Krishna consciousness, it just doesn't go well together. Because where's the purification? Without opposition, another statement by Prabhupada, is that without opposition, where's the chance for glorious victory? So we need challenges. Without challenges, we don't progress in Krishna consciousness. If everything is going well, then what's the impetus to progress? So we as preachers of the Krishna consciousness movement should be voluntarily thinking we want more and more for Krishna. Like Prabhupada had that uh, example that he gave one time, that there was one impersonalistic guru or impersonal guru, if you can call him a guru, he was pushing away money, and Prabhupada said, you can take a picture of him, that is Prabhupada, pulling in the money and using it for Krishna. Because a devotee sees that everything belongs to Krishna. And so he's willing to actually stick his neck out to serve Krishna, to give up his own personal happiness for the happiness of Krishna. And as we mentioned last night, we were talking about... Uh, the different uh, manifestations of happiness or uh, motivations in Krishna consciousness. I said in the beginning, yes, it's based on relief from all distress, uh, the beginning of auspiciousness like that. Uh, but at the end, it's actually based upon one's motivation or impetus is based upon just seeing Krishna happy with one. A very simple thing. You know, Krishna's smiling, if Krishna is happy, 
than whatever else is happening in the world to them or to the world in general, that's fine. And if Krishna is unhappy, then even if everything else is going well in the world, then that's misery. Remember that. Anyway, that's a very high stage. Don't emulate. As far as the mode of ignorance is concerned, the performer is without knowledge, and therefore all his activities result in present misery, and afterwards he will go on toward animal life. Animal life is always miserable, although, under the spell of the illusory energy maya, the animals do not understand this. <laughs> Never had an animal say, you know, I am miserable. Because the animals are just hankering for something. And hankering. I mean, there may be some peace sometime while they're sleeping, while they have a good master. Prabhupada would often talk about dogs. It's really interesting. Because Prabhupada would talk about dogs needing a master in order to be happy, and if they weren't, didn't have a master, they wouldn't be happy. And then Prabhupada would compare, forgive me, Prabhupada would compare the dogs without a master to someone uh, with a degree from the university who's looking for a job. <laughs> looking for a master. This is very interesting. How? Anyway, it's very interesting. Slaughtering poor animals is also due to the mode of ignorance. The animal killers do not know that in the future the animal will have a body suitable to kill them. That is the law of nature. In human society, if one kills a man, he has to be hanged or hung. That is the law of the state. Because of ignorance, people do not perceive that there is a complete state controlled by the Supreme Lord. Every living creature is the son of the Supreme Lord, and he does not tolerate even an ant's being killed. One has to pay for it. Wow. So let, let me unpack that a little bit. So uh, there's the story that Shruti Kirti, Prabhupada's servant, told that uh, he was massaging Prabhupada uh, underneath or in a, a mosquito, an area that was covered by a mosquito net. And then there was a mosquito in that area. Like that. And he asked Prabhupada, can I kill him? And Prabhupada said, no. But when the mosquito landed on Prabhupada and was getting ready to, to suck Prabhupada's blood, Prabhupada said, kill him. He's an, he's an offender. He's attacking so this is interesting. Every living creature is the son of the Supreme Lord, and he does not tolerate even an ant being killed. It's a very heavy statement. One has to pay for it. So indulgence and animal killing for the taste of the tongue is the grossest kind of ignorance. Now, okay, a question that is probably coming to everybody's mind is that, yes, we have a temple, and sometimes in the temple, insects come particularly... Uh, as they say in Spanish, cucarachas. And for those of you who don't know what that means, that means cockroaches. Should we kill the cockroaches? And that's a big question that devotees need to ask. Of course, Prabhupada said, first of all, prevention is the best thing. You know, if you keep everything sealed up, there's less opportunity for these creatures to come and pollute everything. Uh, on the other hand, even if you do keep everything sealed up, they will still come because I've even experienced these creatures sometimes like to eat electronics, which you can't keep sealed up. So, uh, in the case that hmm, the deity's service is being impeded or the deity's uh, safety or the cleanliness is being impeded uh, or the devotee's, uh, let us say, health is being impeded, then and only then can you do something about the animals. There's some really heavy statements in the Bhagavatam and Prophet's purports that so a householder should see all the animals that are around the house like one's children. There has to be some discrimination, of course, but still unnecessarily to kill animals like if, if you are not careful and so if you go out and you see uh, an anthill and you decide, like some people do, to put gasoline, petrol in the anthill and light it on fire, that's a very sinful act. On the other hand, 
if you happen to be living in the south of the United States, where there's these ants that are called uh, fire ants that can literally kill someone, if you happen to get rid of them to protect the devotees, you're allowed to do that. So it's a judgment call. Like all of these injunctions, uh, there has to be intelligence applied on how to uh, carry out these injunctions. Or when do the injunctions apply, and when do the injunctions not apply. So one has to be very, very careful. But as far as when it comes to killing animals, one has to be very careful about that. A living being has no need to kill animals, because God has supplied so many nice things. He's talking about, probably talking about eating meat here, of course. If one indulges in meat eating anyway, it is to be understood that he is acting in ignorance and is making his future very dark. Of all kinds of animal killing, the killing of cows is the most vicious because the cow gives us all kinds of pleasure by supplying milk. Cow slaughter is the gross act of the grossest type of ignorance. In the Vedic literature, in the Rig Veda 9, 46.4, the words Grobi, Pranita, Matsaram indicate that one who, being fully satisfied by milk, is desirous of killing the cow is in the grossest ignorance. There's also a prayer in the Vedic literature that states, and we're all familiar with this, Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmana Tayacha Jagadataya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha. O oh Lord, you are the well-wisher of the cows and the brahmanas, and you are the well-wisher of the entire human society and world. Vishnu Purana, 1.19.65. The purport is that special mention is given in that prayer for the protection of the cows and the brahmanas. The brahmanas are the symbol of spiritual education, and cows are the symbol of the most valuable food. These two living creatures, the brahmanas and the cows, must be given all protection that is real advancement of civilization. In modern human society, spiritual knowledge is neglected and cow killing is encouraged. It is to be understood then that human society is advancing in the wrong direction and is clearing the path to its own condemnation. A civilization which guides the citizens to become animals in their next lives is certainly not a human civilization. The present human civilization is, of course, grossly misled by the modes of passion and ignorance. It is a very dangerous age, and all nations should take care to provide the easiest process, Krishna consciousness, to save humanity from the greatest danger. Now, as far as cow killing is concerned, uh, if one kills a cow, one will have to take birth, according to the Manasamita and other literatures, uh, as a cow for every hair that is on the cow's body. If you kill another animal, you will have to take one animal birth in that particular species. So please protect the cows. Not only uh, stop killing cows, but cows are meant to be protected. And another thing, and I know this is not going to strike everybody as ecstatic, that if you are buying things that uh, indirectly, or even directly, uh, cause harm to a cow, or cause cows to be killed, or cows to be exploited, or their children to be exploited, or their children, which we're talking about calves right now, to be exploited or killed, there is some, some reaction for it. What can I say? If you're buying something, let's say, Prabhupada, that's why Prabhupada prohibited leather, uh, that the devotee should not buy leather, because he said leather is a product of violence. Uh, cow killing. Now, if you can get leather like in a Madanga drum, absolutely, you're sure, comes from a cow that's already died or died naturally, that's another thing. So we have to be very careful about not getting implicated, either directly or indirectly, in this cow-killing civilization. Very, very, very simple. I was uh, informed some time ago that India is, if not the largest, but one of the largest exporters of leather in the world. And the way that they would uh, produce that leather is that they would march the cows into some state in India where uh, 
cow killing is allowed. And I'm not going to mention which states that is. And then the cow would be immersed in this tanning solution while it was still alive, and they would rip the skin off of the cow. Such a sinful, sinful, sinful act to perform. So, anyway, so really be careful that whatever you're doing, you're not directly or indirectly implicated in the mistreatment of cows or any creature, but especially the cows. Okay, next verse. Satvat sanjayate gyanam rajaso loba hi vacha pramada moha tamaso bhavato gyanam evacha Satvat from the mode of goodness. Sanjayate develops gyanam, knowledge, rajasaha from the mode of passion, lobaha greed, eva certainly, cha also, pramada, madness, moha and illusion, tamasa from the mode of ignorance, bhavataha develop. Ajnanam, nonsense, eva certainly, cha also. From the mode of goodness, real knowledge develops. From the mode of passion, greed develops. And from the mode of ignorance, develop foolishness, madness, and illusion. And of course, you read about this before. This is a little bit repetitive. Purport, since the present civilization is not very congenial to the living entities, Krishna consciousness is recommended. Through Krishna consciousness, society will develop the mode of goodness. When the mode of goodness is developed, people will see things as they are. In the mode of ignorance, people are just like animals and cannot see things clearly. In the mode of ignorance, for example, they do not see that by killing one animal, they are taking the chance of being killed by the same animal in the next life. Actually, I was just listening to a memory of a conversation Prabhupada was having with some priests in uh, Mexico. Okay. And two priests came to see Prabhupada. Originally, the cardinal was supposed to come, but the cardinal couldn't make it, so he sent these two priests. And one of the things that Prabhupada said, just to test them, he said that he was very much against this uh, bullfighting, which is very famous in Mexico. It's a horrendous sport. Uh, when I was young, I went on a tour of the United States with a group of young people. And uh, one of the things is we went to Mexico and Tijuana and saw a bullfight. And it was so disgusting. They would kill the bull with this big blade and torture the bull while, while they were playing with it. And then at the end, they would cut off the bull's ears and they would give the bull's ears to the prettiest girl in the audience. So disgusting. I was just nauseated by the whole thing. And I have a very clear memory of it, even though it occurred when I was seven, uh, 16 years old, 16 or 17 years, 16, I think, uh, 16 years old, when I saw this, but just, I remember this as clear as it was yesterday. Just horrible, horrible. So the Prabhupada, to test these priests, said, this bull killing must stop. And then the priest just about then left. And Prabhupada started, he actually started laughing. You see, I, I've tested them. They are not Christians. Prabhupada said they are not Christians. Because Christians would never be in favor of something like that. Real Christians. So, uh, because people have no education and actual knowledge, they become irresponsible. To stop this irresponsibility, education for developing the mode of goodness, the people in general must be there. When they're actually educated in the mode of goodness, they become sober and in full knowledge of things as they are. Then people will be happy and prosperous. Even if the majority of the people aren't happy and prosperous, if a certain percentage of the population develops Krishna consciousness and becomes situated in the mode of goodness, then there is the possibility for peace and prosperity all over the world. Otherwise, if the world is devoted to the modes of passion and ignorance, there can be no peace or prosperity. In the mode of passion, people become greedy and their hankering for sense enjoyment has no limit. One can see that even if one has enough money and adequate arrangements for sense gratification, there is neither happiness nor peace of mind. That is not possible because one is situated in the mode of passion. If one wants happiness at all, his money will not help him. He has to elevate himself to the mode of goodness by practicing Krishna consciousness. When one is engaged in the mode of passion, not only is he mentally unhappy, but his profession and occupation are also very troublesome. He has to devise so many plans and schemes to acquire enough money to maintain his status quo. I mean, status quo means the present situation. 
It's a fancy way of saying that. This is all miserable. In the mode of ignorance, people become mad, being distressed by their circumstances. They take shelter of intoxication unless they sink uh, further into ignorance. Uh, their future in life is very dark. I'll tell you something funny that I just found out yesterday. Uh, sometimes I tell the devotees this uh, story we learned when we were young. It was called the story of Rip Van Winkle. Now, for those of you who are not Americans, you wouldn't know that story. It's about a man who actually went to sleep for 20 years. Uh, devotees disagreed with me, with me last night. They said it was 100 years. It was actually 20 years, the story. And he woke up and the entire world was changed. Well, I found out yesterday that that story was based on true life. Now, what was that true life? That this man didn't go to sleep for 20 years, but uh, de facto slept for 20 years. How? He got intoxicated. This man, it was in the 1700s in, in America. I mean, we're all thinking, you know, bars and everything is something nice and new and uh, modern culture. We have so many nice bars. But bars and intoxication have been around since time immemorial. In fact, even in the spiritual world, there's the original form of intoxication. But that intoxication is bliss, love of God. And there's some manifestations of it. But in the material world, which is a reflection of the spiritual realm, excuse me, uh, then you have this gross intoxication, which actually makes one unconscious and act in such a way that's detrimental even to their own welfare. So what happened is this particular story is based upon a man named Rip Van Winkle, who basically had an argument with his wife, got intoxicated, disappeared for 20 years. <laughs> and it happens. This is a true life story. Very, very interesting. So we should avoid all types of intoxication. Now, generally, when we take our initiation vows, we say no uh, intoxication, like coffee, tea, cigarettes, marijuana. Of course, nowadays, you have to cover all the bases, especially if you're in Fiji. You have to mention kava. Kava is like the local drink. It's like a relaxant, a muscle relaxant The people take and they, or drink, and they just stay awake all night long, long talking nonsense. So, but we have to be careful of other types of effective intoxication. Effective intoxication means, let's say if we just like watch TV all day long, or play video games. I'm not saying that those are against the regulated principles, but what they do is they put you into, as Prabhupada described intoxication, he said intoxication means to go into an illusion within an illusion. In other words, we're in an illusion right now. What illusion are we in right now? We think we're this body. We think that we're members of a particular family. We think that we're uh, of a particular nationality. We think we're a particular race. We think so many things that have nothing to do with reality because they're all very temporary, as we heard from the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, nasato vijate bhavo na bhavo vijate sataha ubiyorapi drishtavantas twaniyas takvadarsvi. The sages say that those things which are temporary are unreal. So that's a sort of intoxication. Like if I start to, not me of course, if someone takes intoxication and they think they're the greatest, you find that sometimes. Someone takes intoxication and they become like, oh, I'm wonderful. Uh, and that's an illusion. And when they come off of the intoxication, they realize they're just like useless, hopeless, whatever. So uh, we're in this intoxicated state that lasts for upmost 100 years, or illusory state. But everyone in this world is intoxicated in that way. So if within intoxication, you go into an another illusion, I mean, if you take some sort of intoxication, you go into another illusion, then 
That's an illusion within an illusion. Just like sometimes you may be dreaming at night. Uh, not sometimes, usually you do dream at night. And then while you're dreaming at night, sometimes you dream that you're dreaming. And sometimes you dream that you dream that you're dreaming. So why put ourselves deeper into illusion that we have to be, or we don't have to be, than we are right now? So anyway, so this is why we have this injunction against intoxication. And we should examine our lives, the reason I'm talking about this, is to see what things we do that are effective or de, de facto intoxication. Because we do things that are not directly breaking the regulated principles, but put us into an illusion within an illusion. And to get out of this illusion, what? Chant Hare Krishna. Cheto Darpana Marjanam. Baba Mahat Bhagni Nevrapanam. When you chant the Lord's holy names, then you need mirror the heart, the mirror of the mind becomes clarified, and one sees the self and the super self. You wake up. Or as Bhakti Thakur says, Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, uh, Gora Chanda Bole, Kota Nidra, Yao Maya Pisa Chira Kole. Okay. All right, so I think we'll take some questions. Here, okay. Wow, we got a big group here. Okay, let me take you off of mute so you can all ask questions. Wait a second. Okay, who has a question, Nalini Khan? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare What's your question? Uh, Gurudev, what's the difference between anarthas and ignorance, like not breaking the regu regulative principles, but envy, anger, and competition with other devotees in negative sense. Is that ignorance as well? Offensive? You're talking about offenses? Yes. Uh, uh, well, offenses are actually very dangerous, especially uh, against other Vaishnavas. One loses a taste for hearing and chanting. One has to be very careful in dealing with Vaishnavas Actually, what I, I was asked a similar question about that today. Uh, what do you do when you have these negative thoughts about people, about Vaishnavas? Let's not talk about just people right now. Like if I, we all do things like, uh, there's this word, cop an attitude towards people. In other words, we give people a, a label. Oh, he or she is just this or that. What do you do about it? Well, what I do about it when these thoughts come to our mind like if I think, oh, Nalini Kant, he's just a rascal. So when the thought comes, no, it doesn't come to my mind like that. I think you are adorable, <laughs> Nalini Kant, not a rascal. So anyway, so when the thought comes to my mind uh, about you, or about anybody, that it, if it's negative, then immediately I'll start to praise them in my mind. You know, because we can find fault in anything, just like you can look at the moon and see the spots in the moon, or you can look at the moon and think it's how beautiful it is. Actually, one time, Krishna said to Radharani, your face is just like the moon, and Radharani got really upset because she said, you think my face had spots in it? So, you know, anyway, it's an interesting pastime. So, so the point is, we can find fault. In anybody, even Krishna. I mean, just like the other day, I was finding fault in Krishna. Not Krishna, Lord Ram. Because Lord Ram, what does he do? Just some washerman complains uh, that, you know, that Ram accepted Sita Devi back when she was in Ravana's house for such a long period of time. And this washerman was saying this because he, he wanted to kick his wife out of the house. And so... I, and Ram, what did Ram do? He said to see today, be, uh, basically he said to Lakshman, you better drop her off in the woods. And I was thinking, I'm not happy with what he did. So, <laughs> so you could even find fault in Lord Ram. Of course, there's an ex a reason he did that. There's an esoteric reason and an exoteric reason. I understand that. But still, you know, it's not that everybody's happy that that happened. So you can find fault with anybody, but instead think of the good things. 
everybody, at least all devotees, have so much overwhelming good qualities to them. Uh, and they may have a little speck of dust there, some habit from past activities or quirks or eccentricities that they have due to whatever reason. And then you just look at the good, then you start to glorify them in your mind. Oh, this devotee, even though, let's say, let's take a devotee who's really cheap, who doesn't want to spend money. He's, you can just really get on his case. <laughs> Someone's raising their hands in the audience. Anyway, so he's, so a devotee is really cheap and he's so stingy that you ask, you know, you're, you're in the kitchen and you ask for, uh, some uh, some potatoes, and he brings you half a potato because it's, it's a better <laughs> price. <laughs> or potatoes with all with spots all over them because it's cheaper. And he thinks that you cooks so they can just cut the spots out. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you know, at least, at least we got at least we got them as a donation. Anyway, I'm just teasing. <laughs> So, so anyway, so then you, you start to think, oh, that devotee is driving me crazy. Uh, I got to <laughs> the potatoes. And then, but instead you should think, you change, you know, do a little switch in your mind and say, that devotee is so wonderful. He's just trying to protect Krishna's money from being spent. I really appreciate that good quality. But I sure as hell hope he gets better potatoes next time. <laughs> that's, that's funny. In other words, don't criticize devotees. Don't put labels on devotees. If they do something that you disagree with, just talk to them. They're just trying to serve Krishna. And that's the way I look at it. And... Uh, Appreciate their good qualities. Be like a honeybee. Madu maki. Be madu maki. Not just a maki. Maki. <laughs> madu maki is a, is a honeybee. And maki is just like a fly. A fly. A fly goes after the bad stuff. So we should see the good qualities. Good qualities, just like, I mean, just like that story I always told about that person named Pigpen, you know. The good quality is that he touched Prabhupada's feet. <laughs> Besides that, didn't have too many good qualities. <laughs> but then he developed all good qualities. So we, we should be like that. I mean, we're like one family, the family of devotees. Just like a parent has some son with some undesirable qualities, the parent still loves the son. Or daughter. So we should be like that with each other, especially with devotees and with everybody. I mean, we should fan the spark of devotion in everyone's heart. That's how we bring people to Krishna consciousness. You fan the spark of devotion. So is that all right? And that's how you deal with a critical attitude. What? Guru, uh, just to follow up on that. So the ones who are unable to get rid of these anarthas, so then they go into ignorance mode and they can born as animals then? The one who is who are not ready to give it rid of the anarthas? No, yes. a, a, a devotee is not going to be born as an animal even if he has an arthas. As long as he's not breaking the regulated principles, as long as he's not eating meat or taking intoxication or anything. I mean, there are exceptions, like Bart Maharaj, who was put into the body of a deer. Oh, Bart Maharaj was not breaking the regulated principles, but he was put into the body of a deer. But he had his human memory there, his perfect memory of his last life. So this was actually a special arrangement. I mean, even when you make some, some general rule, then many times there's special arrangements that Krishna makes for the devotee's benefit. And that was one special arrangement. But... Generally, we can say that a devotee, someone who's taken up Krishna consciousness, is not going to be an animal in his next life, even if he has an arthas. 
The main thing is if we want to have a taste for hearing and chanting, we should be thinking positively about the devo other devotees. If you do that, Krishna will appreciate it so much. All right? Guruji, so, sorry, just one, one more question within okay, that. Uh, so some, sometimes in, uh, uh, when we say regulative principles, a uh, subtle way we can contribute to that, like, uh, uh, like we don't eat meat, but uh, uh, we are in the same community where everything is happening and we buy products from the same uh, supermarket or thing who are making money. Subtle yeah, that, that can't be avoided. One should minimize those things. Obviously, obviously you're buying from the supermarket, the salaries of the people working in the supermarket are used for, you know, buying all sorts of abominable substances. The supermarket is buying all sorts of abominable substances, making profit from the things you buy, but you can't get out of it. As I said, one has to exercise intelligence in dealing with these things. Because you can't. You're, somehow or other, you're going to be at least a little indirectly connected with these activities going on. There's no way to avoid it. I mean, just like you buy gasoline, you buy petrol, sorry. You buy petrol, the money that's going to the petrol station will be used by someone to buy meat. You know, just a simple thing like that. Or right now I'm using electricity. The people who work for the power company. They're, you know, the power is being used to power pig farms here. And North Carolina is one of the biggest pig states in the world. There's more pigs in North Carolina than people. That's an interesting thing. I was also reading in Denmark, it was also Danish ham is famous. There's 60 million pigs in the country, and there's less than 10 million people. So, interesting statistic. So the point, the point is that somehow or other we're always indirectly connected, but let's minimize that. Minimize it. Don't. Just be aware of what you're doing, how it's affecting other people, and how much you are connected. You can't eliminate the connection without going to the Himalayas and just like rejecting all of modern society. There's no other way to do that. So minimize it. It's, practi it's practical. I mean, everything, you know, buying computers or talk, you know, anything I do is connected to indirectly to some nefarious activity in society. <clears throat> but just don't, just be careful, especially when in regard to cow killing. Anything connected to killing the cow, torturing the poor calves, uh, torturing the bulls, and this is the most sinful activity one can actually think of. There is no more sinful activity than the uh, torturing of cows. And Brahmins, and, oh, another thing is, yeah, it says human society means the protection of cows, Brahmins, old people, and children. And any society that doesn't protect these uh, four classes is actually a very sinful society. Any society where women, women are exploited, cows are exploited, uh, children are mistreated, exploited, or old people like me are not taken care of. <laughs> That's a very sinful society. So you should all take care of me. All right, so who else has a question? Ranga Devi had a question. She typed it in. Oh, she typed it in. Let me just look. It's under at Julian. It. Anyway, I look at my chats. What if you are upset with a devotee for being critical? That's interesting. You can be upset with an action of a devotee. That's one thing. But if you call, but if you give a devotee a bad name, you know that devotee is useless, hopeless, uh, hypercritical devotee. Then that's a, that's really criticism of the devotee. You can criticize an action. But to criticize a devotee, and this is a fine line, of course, is another thing. And if you're upset with a devotee, 
It's all right to be upset with a devotee for being critical of others. Yeah. It's all right to be upset. Don't criticize that devotee. Two wrongs do not make a right. I mean, we do get upset with people for doing certain things. There's nothing wrong with that. We can't uh, restrain ourselves from being upset. Okay? That's a good question. So, any other questions or comments? Gurudev, can I ask something about cow protection? Yes. So, if a cow is suffering, um, what is the situation uh, regarding euthanasia? Uh, you're, uh, do you suffer sometimes? Yes. Do you want me to put you out of your misery? Do you want me to answer that question honestly? <laughs> no. I mean, Oh, well, frankly speaking, we are, we are against euthanasia because if any living entity is suffering, that's due to their, I hate to say this, karma. I mean, we could try to alleviate their suffering. I mean, certainly if a cow is suffering uh, due to some disease, whoop, maybe you disappeared. Maybe your little box where you were disappeared. Oh, there you are. It's like Hollywood Squares. So anyway, so <laughs> I'll get square. You know, really, really difficult. There's a lot of squares here. So uh, the point is, yes, we can try to alleviate the suffering. Like if you were suffering through some bodily problem, then uh, I would tell you to go to a doctor and get some anesthesia or something. It's like if a devotee has some terminal illness, like uh, cancer then we would, they would take some drug or something like that to actually alleviate their pain. But to kill a living entity before their time is not appropriate. It's not mercy killing. I mean, now, of course, I think in America, a certain time, there was this one doctor called Dr. Dev. Kevorkian. At Kevorkian. And I, don't, I think in one, maybe not in America, one other country, it's actually legal. And I forget which country it is right now. I think people can go there and be killed if they want. Denmark. Anyway, somewhere. Somewhere. But, but the point is, we have a certain amount of karma. We're put in that situation. It's not uh, allowed for us to kill a living entity unnecessarily, unless that living entity is attacking us. So I would be against it. I mean, of course, you have that story in uh, the UK where they had cows, old cows, and the government took those cows away from them and uh, killed them because the devotees refused to put them down. So we should not do that. We should not do that. It's, it's, it's actually um, very sinful to kill a living entity unnecessarily. But especially people that have pets and dogs, cats, and even cows, when the, the pet or the animal is suffering immensely, you see it's in pain, it can't eat, it's certainly going to die anyway, um, then euthanasia is very common in the Western countries. I know, unfortunately. I'll give you a story. One, uh, two of my disciples, a married couple, had a dog that was actually stopping to eat. He had cancer, very, very sick. So what did they do is they kept chanting to him and he actually became absorbed in the chanting and was crying, hearing the holy names and he left his body in such a way like that. Wow. And, uh, and they were very merciful and this dog was part of their family. And so that's what we should do. If someone's getting ready to leave their body, we should be around them and giving them the holy name not kill them. And it's very sinful. Okay, someone sent a message here. Oh, it's a message about my birthday book. From <laughs> Lila Shakti to everybody. <laughs> okay, copy the message. It's time for birthday, which is at the end of October this year. So, all right. Any other questions? Any other quick questions? Since... 
or problems? No. Everybody's happy. Natasha, it's good to see you. Hare Krishna. We'll be coming to Australia as soon as, soon as the Yamadutas let me come. Okay, no other questions. This is pretty interesting. Nobody else has questions here. Can I ask Gurudev if no one has? Uh-oh. Yes, you can ask. <laughs> Gurudev, I think I was listening from you in one of your lecture or was reading from a Krishna book where yeah. when Uddhava returns and he uh, talks about uh, uh, Gopi's separation, and yeah. there were some uh, uh, physical characteristics explain how uh, I mean they they look in in the separation from Krishna. How do we yeah. understand? Is it something similar to what uh, Sanatan Goswami experienced as when he got the sores on the body and things like that? I don't think so. No, <laughs> Sanatan Goswami. Sores were not manifestations of his love of God, but they were a test uh, that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sent to see hmm, Sanatan's devotion. It's a little bit different. That was different. I mean, I can't, yeah, you know, it's because Sanatan Goswami went through the Jarakanda forest without eating or drinking. He drank water that caused these sores. And that was directly arranged by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, so that Lord Chaitanya could test Sanatan Goswami. Uh, the way he tested Sanatan Goswami is he had Sanatan Goswami come to see him, and Sanatan Goswami had two choices to come through uh, past the temple in Jagannath Puri or to come on the beach route. And the problem with the beach route, beach route, I, the route through the beach, <laughs> sounds like a prashadam, beach route, a beach route. So anyway, the problem with the, with the route, the way through the beach, was that the beach sand was white hot, you know, red hot or whatever you call it like that, and burnt his feet. And, the, and he chose the most difficult uh, way to go see Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because he didn't want to pass by the temple door. He felt he would contaminate the Pujaris who were actually serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So in this way, he passed Lord Chaitanya's test. And sometimes Lord Chaitanya puts us through tests. The symptoms of that test may not be symptoms of ecstasy, but they may be symptoms that, or arrangements by the Lord. Just like right now, mm -hmm. I'm sneezing. It's not that he's sneezing. The sneezing I'm doing, of course, I sneezed a few minutes ago. The sniffling I'm doing is not a symptom of ecstasy. It's not that I want devotees after this class saying, oh, Guru Maharaj was in so much ecstasy. During the class, he was, he was crying in ecstasy and tears were coming from his eyes like torrents of rain. And his nose was running, you know. So you, we have to be careful not to mix those two things. All right? Thank you. And anyway, when devotees experience the symptoms of ecstasy, the bumps come on the body. That The bumps come and go. They don't just stay there. For six months or eight months. Because <laughs> then if they stay there for eight months, you better go see a doctor. <laughs> so if I if I start if I start to get those sort of symptoms of ecstasy, I'll go to see you, Nalini Kant, and have be treated <laughs> for eczema. <laughs> okay. On that happy note, I think we should end. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see everybody tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is our Sunday feast in which you'll get a chance to eat virtual prasadam by the mercy of Radha and Krishna. Oh, yeah, just one thing I wanted to show you all was very nice before. One of my dear disciples in Australia sent me all these necklaces for my deities, some of which we can use for Radha and Krishna. I don't, you see them all? There's 32 necklaces. She's such a great disciple that she, uh, phew, she sent all these beautiful necklaces, crystal 
necklaces and beads and all sorts of things. Isn't this beautiful? So some of them we'll use for Radharani and Krishna. I like Krishna too. And some of them we will actually uh, I'll use for my deities here. I was in ecstasy today getting these. Wonderful. I just wanted, I don't know if she's watching or not, but I just wanted to appreciate what great devotion she had. Sent all the way from Australia at a great cost to her. Okay, on that happy note, all glories to His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Hari Bo.